thank you for that introduction. Uh, and so, uh, like Susan said, I have just arrived here from uh, New York about uh, three months ago in January. And so uh, I've been working on getting my lab up and running uh, and kind of settling in. So I'll tell you guys some of uh, what I hope to do uh, kind of in the immediate uh, present of running the lab and then kind of some of the more far out things I hope we get to ask and questions we get to answer uh, for as long as we get to ask and answer questions. All right. So uh, I really like to think about uh, how, different how different eukaryotes control virus infection, and specifically how individual cells do this. Um, and so this is all my information. Uh, you can find me at SLU, and you can email me if you need to reach me. And so uh, I have nothing to disclose, because um, I haven't done anything in 24 months besides be a postdoc. Uh, so, uh, I have these kind of three, like what I like to call as uh, asymptotic questions. Uh, how do cells defend against virus infection? How does the cell regulate this? And how do viruses counteract this? And these are just questions that uh, will never have a true end. Uh, there will always be viruses, always more things to ask. But this is kind of what orients us in the lab to how we think and what we want to accomplish. And we think about this for kind of all the obvious reasons, so both the benefit to human health, when we're thinking about uh, the human innate immune system and human viruses, uh, the basic biology that comes out of just understanding these, these systems, so they often end up being wonderful tools to dissect different pieces of the cell. Uh, you know, in my PhD, I was kind of taught that viruses are the best cell biologists, and so as we try to understand more about ourselves, we get to use these as a tool. Um, and then uh, biotechnology, just because as uh, I think most of us uh, are kind of aware in the back of our minds, most major antiviral systems that have been discovered have been uh, incredibly useful for advancing both science and medicine, right? And so can we find something new that can also be of use? And so uh, I like to just think about this really broadly, not instead of, uh, I like to, I like to, position myself very broadly inside of just host marker uh, relationships, right? Because these are full of molecular innovation. And so uh, you have antimicrobials, such as antifungals and uh, anti, uh, antibiotics. And then you have antivirals that are made from different proteins. So uh, these chain terminating uh, nucleic acids made by this protein Viperin, uh, as well as uh, interferons that I'll talk about a little later today. And then as I kind of told you, as I just kind of mentioned, through genetic modification, the kind of nuts and bolts of these uh, antiviral restriction systems uh, are incredibly useful for standard molecular biology and also uh, through the advent of CRISPR and other, and other gene modifying um, uh, enzymes, you know, uh, precision medicine. And so uh, I think about viruses, right? And so I think about two very specific and very different areas of uh, this virus-host interaction. And so one on, uh, I guess, your left, my right, uh, is the interferon response, uh, which is inside of all ver vertebrates. And this is just uh, coupling the detection of viral infection to uh, the release of a cytokine that then goes on to uh, instigate a signaling, a, a transcription pathway to elaborate around 300 genes that protect the cell from viral infection. The other thing that I like to really think about is uh, amoeba. And so this is a bit uh, strange sometimes for people, um, but uh, amoeba have these very beautiful, very enigmatic giant viruses that whose genomes can get up to about two and a half to three uh, megabases, rivaling the size of some of the smallest uh, bacteria. And so uh, no one knows how amoeba defend themselves against these viruses. And so since uh, I have more people to do more things that are in my mind, I get to make them ask, answer this question for me. Um, and so the questions that I focus on when I really think about this uh, on the interferon side are just how do we think about the cell-specific regulation of the interferon response? Uh, how do we think about how the interferon response is kept off at baseline? And then are there any new mechanisms of our antagonism we can find after we uncover some of these things that we are asking about? And then for the uh, amoeba antiviral responses, it's actually a wide open field, which is also really fun. So just what are they, how are they regulated, and what do viruses do to interfere with them? Some of these basic questions uh, before we can build up anything else. All right. 
Uh, and so today on the interferon side, uh, and actually for, for the bulk of this uh, talk, I'll really be talking to you about uh, how interferon is suppressed at baseline or a mechanism by which that happens. All right. So I'm just going to zoom out and kind of give you guys an overview of the interferon response uh, in case you are not uh, super familiar with it. Um, and so I like to think of the interferon response as proceeding in three particular stages. First is a cell that's at rest, and so this has no reason to have an interferon response on. It kind of has all the machinery ready to go, uh, so adapters, sensors, transcription factors, uh, just in case it needs to be stimulated. Uh, the second phase is the active stimulation, the interferon response, and this, and this picture is represented by the infection of an RNA virus. And so uh, this viral nucleic acid is dumped into the cell. It uh, creates a double-stranded intermediate that is then recognized by one of two or potentially both uh, double-stranded RNA um, sensors, uh, RIGI and MDA5. Those go to the mitochondria where they um, bind this protein MAVs and instigate this incredible signaling cascade uh, that leads to the trend uh, the translocation of a set of transcription factors to go into the nucleus and turn on gene transcription uh, of type 1 and type 3 interferons, which are the ones I will be talking about today, and a small, very small subset of interferon-stimulated genes. This interferon is secreted outside the cell, uh, and then binds to receptors in either a paracrine or autocrine manner, and then in instigates a second signal transduction cascade that leads to another uh, separate transcriptional complex being formed and sitting on promoters of genes uh, that are stimulated by this response, which we call interferon-stimulated genes. And these are the 300 or so odd genes that are elaborated in order to protect, our, protect individual cells from viral infection. So I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking uh, down here at this, at this transcriptional space uh, and understanding how different transcription factors are involved in regulating this. This is not something that I ever would have thought I was really going to study. I tried to really avoid thinking about the nucleus for most of my time. Uh, but during my postdoc, there were a couple different uh, things that I watched uh, and then became curious about that have led me to uh, this, to focus in this space. And so the first is really building off of some work from a former graduate student in the Benjamin Mason Duver lab who is now uh, a postdoc here in, Michael Gale, in the Michael Gale lab in immunology, uh, who is trying to understand this strange phenomenon that um, uh, stem cells, pluripotent or embryonic, induced or not, uh, are impaired in responding to the interferon response. And I'm not going to go super into uh, all that uh, Julie figured out, but what I will tell you about is uh, to make these IPSCs, you uh, throw in these three Yamanaka factors, OCT4, SOX2, and KLA4, all which are transcription factors. And so Julie did this experiment where she transfected these uh, individual transcription factors in combination with uh, a mutant version of uh, an IRF protein which uh, constitutively act forces a constitutive activation of the interferon response. And when she did this, she saw uh, that, the that these three proteins individually and then all together uh, are quite capable of suppressing the interferon response. Right? And this is measured here by just looking at the relative expression of an interferon stimulated gene called IFIT1. Uh, so of these three proteins, KLA4 was the strongest one and caught my eye because it's a member, it's a member of a 17-member family. And so I just became a little bit curious about, uh, you know, is this something that's shared just, uh, is it just unique to this one protein or is it shared across this family? And so this family, they often share uh, a very similar DNA binding domain, the zinc finger domain, but uh, their N-terminal domains, which kind of specify what they bind and how they act, are quite different. And so uh, when we take that same experimental setup and transfect uh, our, our, our IR7 with our different KLFs, we really appreciate that uh, about two-thirds of these have some ability to suppress the interferon response. And that was just weird to me, because uh, it's to me, I just picked like kind of random family out of the blue, and two-thirds of them seem to have an impact. And uh, as we normally talk about the interferon response, we really only discuss the proteins that 
the transcriptional proteins that bind uh, the promoters that have been well defined. And so this kind of question of like, well, how many are of transcription factors out there are out there that modify the interferon response was seeded from this experiment. And then second uh, was kind of thinking back on some of our COVID work and uh, the Tenuva lab sat at the end of one of these kind of drug pipelines where people would test all their in vitro things and then we had hamsters and so we would test everything in hamsters. And so we uh, went through a ton of hamsters with all these drugs, all of them didn't work. Uh, except for these two that either were interferon or induced interferon, right? And so obviously interferon was identified as an antiviral compound, right? Um, and so it's not, it's not anyone's surprise, right? No one's rediscovering something. Uh, but it did just kind of turn our mind to thinking about how we can uh, get interferon to where it needs to be in order for it to be maximally effective. And so we know both from work in SARS-CoV-2 and influenza that giving interferons, especially type 1 interferons, systemically does very little for uh, viral disease and symptoms, right? However, if you give it locally, so in the airway passage, you're able to suppress viral burden and disease um, and help like, lead to a cure or even be preventative, right? And so uh, when we think about kind of what specifies tissues, the specifies, specifies cells, we find ourselves back at thinking about transcription factors as the master regulators of cell fate. So again, thinking like this has come back up, right? And so uh, also while all this was going on, people were starting to really note that although we describe our uh, interferon response as responding to exogenous stimuli from viruses or bacteria or something else, um, we, in fact, make everything that is necessary in order to activate the interferon response. Uh, however, this is modulated by either uh, proteins that are uh, enzymes that are designed around metabolizing the uh, these inflammatory nucleic acids that we ourselves make, or kind of uh, through evolution setting the detection level of our sensors to be above the level that's normally made. But if you're going to invest all this energy in metabolism and sensing, you might think about uh, investing energy and in actually uh, regulating the production, right? And since we're talking a bunch about nucleic acid, nucleic acid metabolism, that brings us back to the nucleus uh, and, for my interest, back to uh, the transcription factors, right? And so these are the three questions that I kind of wanted to start asking. So what is the breadth of transcription factors that impact the interferon response, the interferon pathway? Uh, do any of these that we identify play a tissue-specific role in modulating interferon response? And then finally, do any of these uh, transcription factors that we're able to identify play a role in controlling the production of immunost immunostimulatory nucleic acids? Right? And so to do this, I kind of first generated uh, a cell line that would allow me to kind of screen a bunch of transcription factors quite easily. Uh, and so to do this, I inserted uh, this molecule called Gaussian luciferase, which is secreted out of the cell. Uh, behind the native start codon of MX1, which is a specific and potently induced uh, interference stimulated gene. And so MX1 responds quite well to uh, interferon beta and lambda, and less so to interferon gamma. Uh, <laughs> interferon gamma. Uh, and so uh, this is also what we see with our luciferase cell lines. And so normally when you're looking at uh, MX1 induction by uh, qPCR, you're probably seeing something that's in the thousands of full change, but our luciferase is not that uh, sensitive, and so we have about 130x induction, which is still quite robust. Um, and so it responds as we expected to, and then if we use a virus to activate the interferon response, in this case we're using influenza that's lacking into major interferon antagonist, and then we knock out uh, through CRISPR-Cas9 um, gene, gene editing uh, either IR3, IR3, which is important for the production of interferon beta, or IRF9, which is the part of the complex that is important for uh, actively driving interferon-stimulated genes, of which MX1 is one. Uh, we see that we have this beautiful stepwise reduction in the amount of luciferase. And so this is how we would expect our cell line to work, and so it, it does what it's supposed to do.
So we combined this with a commercially available library uh, that was synthetic guide RNAs and these targeted about 1,600 different genes in the, in the human genome, arrayed in 380 row format. Uh, we fed these to our, Lucif our MX1 cells. So these are actually uh, A549s, which are lung epithelial cells um, that are expressing Cas9. And so we wait about 10 days after we transfect these guide RNAs. Um, and then at the zero hour time point or the zero day time point, we harvest a bit of the supernatant. And this is again to ask if there's anything going on before there's any sort of activation of the interferon response. And then to get some of these later time points, we infect again with our friend uh, Delta NS1 flu. This was just our favorite way of turning on the interferon response in the Tenuver lab. Uh, there's nothing particularly special about why we chose that. And so then we chose a couple different hours post-infection uh, to harvest the supernatants, again, to look at luciferase levels. And so I'm going to bring you back to this slide and just kind of walk you through why we chose each one of our time points, right? And so the zero-hour time point is quite obvious. This is our resting time point. Nothing's been added. But 12, uh, 10 to 12, 24, and 48 represent kind of the acute activation of interferon response, right? Um, and then at the end of the interferon response, uh, some of these ISGs that are elaborated go on to help shut down the interferon response, right? And so we use this eight-day time point to ask if any of our transcription factors are specifically acting in this space, uh, where they're no longer, we're impacting the cessation of the interferon response. So all those things are wonderful and beautiful, but I'm only going to talk to you about this first time point today, this is our time point. And to just fall back to the, the original question, like kind of like the fundamental question, is that if all the antiviral systems we have rely on sensing nucleic acids, how do we avoid detecting our cells, right? And so again, we do have the ability to specify what our, uh, our sensors detect, but we're also able to make everything ourselves. And so there has to be a way. So uh, this is just kind of what the zero hour time point looks like. Uh, looks a little less pretty uh, graphically, but it's okay. Um, so most things don't do anything, which is this of what we want to see. Uh, and then after a cutoff, which is about 1.4 times the amount of luciferase as our um, background, uh, we start to see a couple of genes pop up. And so we do this twice, and we end up with 19 genes, right? Uh, and so those 19 genes are arrayed here uh, for you to look at and gander out. Um, and so each one of these has been, you know, subsequently validated in a clonal, a, a, a different clonal population of these MX1 cells uh, to uh, give us confidence that this, in fact, is true, right? And so uh, there are 19 things up here today, but I'm only gonna to talk to you today about uh, two of these proteins, and then I will mention uh, the third one here in this asterisk. And the two I'm gonna to talk to you about are these DR1 and DRAP1, right? They are, they're also uh, most consistently the two top hits, and what's even better is that they form a complex, right? And so they form this complex called the NC2 complex, uh, which is called this negative cofactor complex. And the point of this complex is to really uh, help specify where RNA, RNA polymerases sit down to initiate transcription. Um, this is done by uh, displacing the TATA binding protein, which kind of organizes uh, the uh, pre-initiation complexes of RNA polymerases uh, displacing TBP from uh, promoters that are kind of cryptic and uh, not robust. Uh, this uh, BTAF1 protein that I said I would mention uh, is also involved in this process, and that just kind of removes TBP from the chromatin. But the loss of all of these things um, lead to something that's called pervasive transcription. And so what pervasive transcription is, is kind of uh, what actually happens inside the cell. And so in your happy wild type cell, you have uh, your gene promoter that's your favorite gene that you're super excited about. Uh, and you have some enhancer elements and maybe you have like a long non-coding RNA region over here, right? And so when we do a lot of our RNA-seq experiments, we just kind of see 
these uh, mRNAs that kind of align to uh, the uh, coding sequence, all the exon all the introns cut out. Uh, maybe we see a little bit of these long non-coding regions, and maybe we see some enhancers here or there, depending on how deep deeply uh, we uh, sequenced. But the rest of this, you would look at and say, like, oh, like nothing's happening inside this region of gene activity, or uh, this region of the genome. But what actually kind of goes on quite normally inside the cell is like all these other regions have a little bit of spurious transcription uh, that uh, pop along. And so maybe you have some in the antisense direction, maybe you have some in this upstream region that hides a, a long non-coding RNA that you never knew about. Um, but this is also taken care of by the cell because it comes through and chews all these up through one of its two exosomes, either the nuclear exosome or the, cy the cytoplasmic exosome. Um, and so in pervasive transcription, what we get uh, is just kind of the overwhelming of this machinery. Uh, and so now you're able to start seeing some of these cryptic transcripts pop up. Uh, and this is largely seen uh, in or seen through uh, RNA-seq experiments looking at these energetic regions, right? Um, so you might have new uh, cryptic promoters pop up that are occupied or ones that were working, that were kind of doing stuff before, uh, have more transcripts coming off of them. But in general, you don't actually see more transcription from just a regular, regular, happy gene promoter, right? Um, and so this down here is kind of uh, what these proteins are involved in stopping. And so uh, we knocked these things out. We saw this luciferase go up, but is luciferase uh, actually interferon response? We don't know. Uh, so we, uh, we did sequencing to look at uh, the transcriptome of these cells and then uh, threw that into kind of uh, pathway annotation software to ask what's the most upregulated things or what are the most downregulated things. And as you can see in both knockouts of GR1 or DRAP1, the top regulated hits are the interferon response. So we are getting just a fully robust interferon response that's happening. Um, there are a bunch of uh, random things that are being downregulated that we don't know about, like this bitter taste in these taste receptors in DRAP1. Uh, so it's unclear if those are just actually things that are being regulated or if it's you know, something weird and random. And so if we see an interferon response as being highly induced, we obviously want to see whether or not that's protective against viral infection. And so we uh, did that as well. And so we have our A549s that are regular, that carry Cas9, that we knock out with either DR1 and DRAP1, and then we infect with uh, either herpes virus, which is a double-stranded DNA virus, or VSV, which is a negative sense RNA virus. Um, and uh, in our non-targeting controls, you see a lot of infection. And then uh, in our GR1 and DRAP1 knockouts, it looks like uh, our interferon response is in fact protecting the cells, right? And so this is nice and robust. So I told you that GR1 and DRAP1 form a complex, and they form this complex through this histine fold domain, right? And so we just wanted to ask if we could uh, kind of recapitulate uh, this interaction uh, by IP and then ask whether or not if we delete this uh, domain uh, and there, uh, thereby uh, abrogate the interaction between DR1 and DRAP1 if we're able to uh, still, if we're able to restore the suppression of the interferon response. And so we take uh, some plasmids to make lentiviruses, we transduce some A549s uh, with uh, flag tag versions of these proteins. And so just to make sure you, that you can see they're all expressed, so this is uh, our wild type uh, GR1, this is our delta his mutant, uh, this is our DRAP1, and this is our delta uh, his mutant for that as well. And so when uh, we do an IP, uh, we find first that our wild types do what they're supposed to. So if we pull down with uh, GR1, we get uh, DRAP1 coming down in bucket loads, and we see the same for the reverse. If we pull down with uh, DRAP1, we see, sorry, if we pull down with DRAP1, we see plenty of GR1 coming down as well. However, uh, uh, we can kind of confirm that this histone fold is uh, important for the interaction. And so when we pull down uh, GR1 with this delta his, we don't pull down DRAP1. And then uh, when we delete the uh, histone fold in DRAP1, we see that uh, the reverse is also true. 
And so now we can go and ask whether or not these are important for uh, suppressing the interferon response. And so we do this, and then we just kind of do qPCRs on uh, these for MX1. Uh, we also do this for type 1 interferons as well as uh, two or three other ISGs. I'm just showing you uh, this MX1 data. And so what we can appreciate is that uh, when you knock out um, GR1, uh, and have nothing to supplement it as you would expect. You have this uh, increased uh, interferon signature. When you uh, replenish the cell, when you reconstitute the cell with uh, exogenous GR1, you're able to um, reduce that back down to baseline levels. But if you lack this interaction domain, you are incapable of suppressing the interferon response, right? And so this is the same thing for DRAP1. And so we can say that these interactions are necessary for these two. And uh, just like with the interferon response, we see the inverse for our, our ability to protect from viral infection. And so uh, when we have our uh, DRAP1 knockouts, uh, they uh, can't be infected, as you saw in that, uh, those microscope images. But if you restore DRAP1 uh, inside the cells, you're able to infect these cells perfectly. Uh, and this also depends on this uh, interaction domain for both GR1 and DRAP1. All right, so we have some a bit of uh, information about what's required on the side of GR1 and DRAP1, but what's actually happening? How is this actually turning on the interferon response? This is kind of what we actually want to know. And so I'm just going to keep this little guy here for you uh, along the side as we journey through the pathway of interferon. And so we're going to go after a couple different uh, proteins that are important so we can kind of dissect out the pathway that uh, is essential for this. And so first we uh, wanted to see, uh, we wanted to be sure that it was dependent upon the secretion of uh, uh, interferon and then as well as uh, interferon binding and signaling through its receptor. And so, we looked first at, a lot, at an ELISA to see whether or not we have interferon, type 1 interferons being secreted from these cells. And when we knock out GR1 and DRAP1, we do see robust secretion of uh, type 1 interferons from these cells. Uh, if we take an antibody that so sops up all that type 1 interferon so that it can't signal to the cells, we're also able to reduce the amount of uh, uh, ISGs, in this case MX1, that's being transcriptionally activated uh, in the absence of GR1 and DRAP1, suggesting that it is this extracellular interferon that is important. And so we have this first part of the pathway kind of checked off. Um, and so I told you earlier that, uh, I showed you this earlier about uh, this viral infection. And so the other way we can make sure that uh, it's, uh, what's required is signaling through the interferon receptor and activation of this ISGI3 promoter is knocking out STAT1, which uh, is right here. Um, and so we do, when we do that, uh, we see that we're also able to restore infection to these cells quite robustly, right? And so again, all this seems to be checking out as we would expect. And so now that we have uh, these two pieces, we're kind of interested in understanding what's going on. And so we uh, took uh, an approach to look at uh, IR3 and MAS, and so IR3 we will assume is going to be important because we see the secretion of interferon is important. IR9 we also believe is important just because uh, we already knocked out STAT1, but STAT1 can make STAT1 STAT1 dimers that can go on to activate uh, interferon, like uh, interferon stim uh, inter yeah, ISGs. Um, and so we also included IRF9 as a second control to knock out this ISGF3 complex, right? And to truly verify that it was uh, this pathway. And so we do this, uh, we knock these proteins out inside of our background of our GR1 and DRAP1s. Uh, and when we're using our luciferase cells again, and kind of what you see is this really beautiful dependence on MAVs, which is what um, are both uh, our rig eye and MDA5 receptors move through, right? Um, and so because it's dependent on MAS, we now have a question of uh, which uh, receptor is, is going to be rig eye or MDA5. And so what's important to know is that these two uh, double strand RNA receptors uh, are bind and are activated by very different uh, double strand RNA uh, modalities. 
And so Rigai really loves uh, these exposed di or triphosphates on short uh, double-stranded or single-stranded RNA, and also doesn't mind if there's a little uh, stem loop going on. Um, MDA5 prefers long double-stranded RNA, usually over 100 nucleotides or base pairs. Um, and so, as I said, we, can, we make everything that we need to turn on the interferon response. And so uh, it's been documented that uh, these vault RNAs or these Y RNAs uh, can be made and then activate uh, Rig I, as well as for MDA5, these ALU elements uh, can form uh, long hairpin structures, uh, long double-stranded hairpin structures that activate uh, uh, MGA5. And so the question is simply, how, do, how is this activated? And when we knock uh, either RIG or MGA5 out, we see this very strong dependence on RIG I exclusively. Uh, and you can appreciate this both uh, in our elucirphase cell lines, but also in, our, in a Western blot, right? And so all Rig I, MDA5, STAT1, MX1, and IFIT1, uh, these are all interferon stimulated genes, right? In addition to some of them being important for the activation of the interferon response. And so we knock out either DR1 or DRAP1, we do see this robust induction of these genes. Um, and this is entirely dependent on Rig I. And when you knock out MDA5, nothing happens. And so this, uh, uh, this suggests to us a very particular pathway. And so, uh, the question just now is, uh, is NC2 doing something to actually suppress Rig I? So is there some kind of secondary function we don't know about that's going to cytosol, it's binding Rig I, it's keeping it chaperoned, uh, or is it just suppressing a Rig I ligand, right? And so to uh, do this, to kind of start to piece this apart, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we know that this protein, DUSP11, uh, is important for cleaving these uh, di and triphosphate, uh, these di and triphosphates from uh, uh, mRNAs, uh, or just RNAs in general, um, to leave just this one alpha phosphate uh, that uh, cannot be sensed by Rig I. And so in the cell, uh, you either have kind of like wild type conditions where there's sufficient uh, DUSP11 and low uh, triphosphate double strand RNA, and you have no interferon activation, or you have kind of uh, pathological conditions where you either, for some reason, have high triphosphate double stranded RNA, or you have insufficient DUSP11, right? And so we can take advantage of uh, uh, a tetracycline, a doxycycline inducible system to increase the levels of DUSP11 inside the cell and ask whether or not that's able to reduce the amount of interferon activation by cleaving these di and triphosphates off of these potential PAMPs, right? These, these potential uh, inflammatory self RNAs. And so uh, we do this, um, and so we knock out uh, either DR1 or DRAP1. We see uh, a large induction of MX1 mRNA, but if we uh, add doxycycline to these cells and increase the amount of DUSP11, we're able to titrate down uh, that, uh, the induction of interferon response, suggesting that what's actually being controlled is uh, what's, being, what's being suppressed by NC2 is some sort of endogenous Rig I ligand, and not that it's doing something out, outside in the cytoplasm with Rig I. And so all these data kind of lead us to this model where we have under, uh, in a wild type cell, um, all of these kind of regulators of uh, these potential inflammatory molecules, uh, either the exosome or DUSP11 that are going around and kind of clipping off and pruning uh, our genome to make sure it's not inflammatory, right? Um, however, in the absence of DR1 and DRAP, DRAP1, uh, it's kind of the current, the current thought, the current hypothesis rather, is that we're simply overwhelming the machinery of the cell, right? And so that uh, you can have all these things that are dedicated to metabolizing uh, your uh, inflammatory, your self-inflammatory PAMPs, uh, but if you, if you have too many of them, it doesn't matter, right? You're always gonna, you're always gonna be overwhelmed the system, so you have to be able to regulate this. Um, and so as we kind of move forward in the lab, one of the things uh, that's the question, or two of the questions that we have, 
uh, are what is Rigai actually binding? Is there a very specific ligand, or is it just kind of haphazard uh, chaos across the genome? And then uh, these DR1 and DRAP1 are important for regulating multiple different RNA polymerases, and so which RNA polymerase is important for this? Um, and so both RNA pole 2 and RNA pole 3 have been shown to be able to create uh, these PAMPs that uh, might activate RIGI endogenously. But pervasive transcription is not a thing that only happens in vertebrates. It's a thing that happens across all orders of life, all domains. And so uh, now we have a really fun question that we get to ask about uh, kind of like evolutionary conservation of this process. And so this is worthwhile thinking about because everything has to contend with the virus. And so far, most of these systems we know use nucleic acid uh, that has some, some form of aberrance to instigate this uh, antiviral cascade. And so you always have to have some sort of ability to main, like, do maintenance on your genome, right? And so uh, we're gonna focus in on eukaryotes uh, because this GR1 and DRAP1 uh, are conserved across all the four major kingdoms of eukaryotes, right? Um, and so uh, we even know that if you take the human versions of these genes and put them into yeast, they're able to rescue the lethality of knocking these yeast genes out, right? And so the actual, the actual function of these is also highly conserved, even though the proteins have diverged as one might expect. And so this allows us to ask kind of a fun question. If we uh, reconstitute uh, the human system with uh, individual pieces of uh, either DR1 or DRAP1 from these disparate lineages, uh, are, we able to, uh, are we able to suppress the interferon response? Uh, or yeah, are we able to restore interferon suppression? Uh, and so we did a pilot of, well, I did a pilot of this right before I left. And so I chose humans, mice, Drosophila, and yeast. Uh, and this is also fun because uh, if you like to think about different antiviral systems, uh, humans and mice use interferon. Uh, Drosophila use, Drosophila, uh, fungi and plants tend to use RNAi. Yeast, no one really knows. Uh, and then at the far end over there is uh, an amoeba, Dictostelium. No one knows what that does either. Um, and so we get to kind of ask this question also laying on how do you uh, defend yourself against viruses, right? And so we just do kind of the same uh, reconstitution experiment that we did. And so we've only, we've only had this really done with our uh, GR1 knockouts. And so what we're able to see quite nicely is that human and mice are able to fully restore the capacity of uh, knocking this out. But if you supplement either Drosophila or uh, yeast, and you get further away from uh, both evolution, but all, like further away from us in evolutionary terms, but also into different antiviral systems, they are not sufficient to block the induction of interferon, right? And so we have uh, some fun questions we can now ask here about is this going to be the same for DRAP1? Uh, it's not necessarily given that it will be. Uh, and then, so this is knocking out one protein and assuming that the you know, non-human version can still interact with the human version. And so maybe that's why the Drosophila and Saccharomyces can't work, right? And so if we give, uh, the, hu if we give the human cell both copies or like both of these genes and knock out both versions of the human gene, um, are we able to restore function, right? And so does it just need its cognate partner to be able to actually function the way it's supposed to? Um, and so these are things that we kind of hope to get into. And so uh, that's kind of all the experiments we've done so far. And so uh, as we kind of start looking further in the future, we start thinking about all these other experiments, all these other hits that we have. Uh, and so we clearly have 19 other hits. And then uh, seven of these also have unique disease, uh, disease variants, right? And so uh, I would be surprised if interferon was responsible for all these problems, right? But can we use the interferon response as a way to understand what is going wrong with these disease variants? And if we're so lucky, can we find that, inter like, is interferon also playing a role in the disease phenotype, right? Uh, to, be, to be determined. And then after that, uh, we also have other genes that were uh, that are deeply concerned across evolution, and then 
I told you we had four other time points, and so we have all the other time points to look at, right? And so there are plenty of things uh, to do for those who wish to do them. And so uh, this is just a short summary of the interferon space. And so we did this CRISPR screen for transcription factors. We identified 19 of them that uh, increase interferon at this, at this basal state. Uh, we showed that uh, DR1 and DRAP1 uh, loss of these two uh, activates a robust and protective interferon state. Uh, this requires the formation of this NC2 complex uh, through their histone fold domains. And uh, we know that this complex uh, regulates pervasive transcription, as well as this protein BTAF1, which also plays a role in this complex. And so these three things kind of point us in this direction of this um, uh, pathway being important, although we have yet to formally demonstrate that. Uh, and then finally, we can see that uh, the way this, these components are, the way that loss of DR1 and DRAP1 is activating uh, the interferon response is exclusively through the rig eye pathway. Uh, so that's the interferon side. Uh, and then the other side of what I think about is amoeba, and I will do this very fast uh, because there isn't a lot, there's no data here, it's all fun and, fun and games. Uh, so the question is simply how do they defend against themselves uh, and how do these viruses fight back, right? And so again, nothing's known, and so let's go figure it out. And so uh, amoeba are uh, incredibly diverse and divergent uh, phylogeny, so there are only 2,400 species, but they range anywhere from three microns to two millimeters. Some of these multicellular ones apparently take up square, square meters, which is terrifying. Uh, but they can be either single cell or multicellular, free living or parasitic. And so I'm largely focused on acanthamoeba, so this is what's been used a lot to find these giant viruses. Um, but there are other kind of popular ones, so Naglaria and Entamoeba, if you're into diseases, Dictocelium, if you're into like really beautiful model systems. Uh, but one of the things that's really fun is that these are all incredibly divergent from each other in evolutionary time, right? And so we call all these things amoeba, uh, but like what does that word mean? No one really knows. Uh, it's kind of, kind of catch-all. Um, and so it's important to just kind of keep in mind that uh, originally, I, when, I went on, when I went into this journey, I was very naive and thought that like all amoeba would use more or less the same system, uh, but they are far away from each other as they are from mice, uh, and mice are closer to uh, flies than any of those amoeba are to each other, right? And so this is an incredible divergence of time and space, uh, and so we're going to really narrow down our words uh, and then focus on the antiviral systems of acanth amoeba. Uh, um, and so what's fun about these viruses, or these uh, amoeba, is not just that they have these giant viruses, but these viruses have viruses, right? And so you now have multiple layers of an antiviral response to look at, right? Because the host, the, well, the amoeba host has to elaborate something against the giant viruses, and the giant viruses have to elaborate something against the virophages, and the virophages have to elaborate something against the giant viruses so that everything can exist. And so it's this really uh, kind of fun, complicated, beautiful system. Um, but three things at once is a bit much, um, and so we are gonna focus first on these, just the giant virus and the amoeba, um, and very little, very interestingly little has been published about defense mechanisms, especially as it comes from what the amoeba actually does, right? Most of them are these virophages or endosymbionts of amoeba that kind of make them inhospitable. Uh, so we think about uh, homologies, right? So there's been all this beautiful work over the last five to seven years about just conservation of antiviral systems uh, across prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes. Uh, and uh, kind of picking out some of these players. However, when we do some of this work in our acanthamoeba friends, there's no clear evidence for any of these genes. Uh, there's no seagas, no sting, which are kind of the two most popular to use when you do these evolutionary trees. Um, at first, I was afraid that it was just like me not knowing how to do bioinformatics, which is entirely possible. Uh, but someone who is much better and much smarter also confirmed this for me, so I feel very comfortable saying this now. 
Um, and uh, so far as we can find, there are no kind of like antiviral components of the RNA machinery. So every eukaryotic organism has microRNA machinery, but that isn't necessarily the same thing as an antiviral RNA I, right? And so uh, there are usually a separate set of machineries that are duplicated uh, to kind of be specified to this response. So uh, we don't, so the first kind of venture really turned up a bunch of emptiness, which is both frustrating and great, right? Uh, it would be great to have something easy to go after. Low hanging fruits are always wonderful, but it's also fun to have an empty playground to play in. Uh, the other thing we can do and what the lab is starting to do is trying to infer uh, through just kind of what are the hallmarks of uh, antimicrobial uh, antiviral genes, right? And so those are simple things that uh, they evolve faster than the genome, so they're positively selected. They tend to be uh, increased in expression during viral insult, uh, so you can use differential expression of RNA-seq. Um, we can think about our amoeba very much the way we think of bacteria, in that there's this pan-genome, and each kind of wild strain you find uh, in a different location will have a different kind of genome content, and all this together makes up a pan-genome. And so the pan-genomes of uh, other microbes are usually, that's where you usually find a lot of your defense islands, as well as kind of uh, environmental and ecological uh, meta metabolic machinery, right? And so maybe we can find some hints in there as we kind of go on to find, uh, uh, you know, new, new acanth amoeba. Uh, and then obviously there's copy number variation, so these genes are duplicated and adds different domains. And so uh, we've started uh, collecting amoeba strains uh, from, the from the wild, uh, and uh, we're going to try to do, like, use this to kind of generate kind of like an initial fo focus list of genes uh, that may be involved, right? It's not a guarantee, but it's worth a shot. Um, and so obviously we're looking for something that's broadly antiviral, right? And so when we think about the interferon system, you can throw whatever virus you want at it, the cell is just refractory, right? Um, and so these giant viruses come in a bunch of flavors, and we happen to have just two of the smallest. And so now we're going prospecting for other viruses uh, so that we can kind of really build out what a broad system is. And so this, all this really requires uh, a bunch of environmental sampling. Uh, and so either wastewater, soil, or river water uh, to look at these things. And then bringing them back to the lab, uh, kind of going through a bunch of different fun isolation steps. These are our little happy acanth amoeba. Uh, and then if we get so lucky as to find a virus, this is what they look like in the aftermath, right? Um, and so we are now kind of getting this pathway up and running uh, with help from uh, Scott Meschke in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences uh, to kind of go through some environmental samples uh, and see if we can find both amoeba as well as these giant viruses to help build up our capacity to really come to answer this question. And so uh, hopefully there'll be more to come soon. Uh, but for now, uh, that's kind of all I have. And so I really want to thank uh, my postdoc advisor, Ben. He kind of allowed me to run willy-nilly and burn up a lot of his money uh, without yelling at me, which is wonderful, um, uh, and really launch uh, a bunch of these projects right before I left. Um, uh, obviously, thankful to both UW Micro and uh, uh, Laboratory Medicine and Pathology for kind of coming together and creating this opportunity for me to you know, live my dream and kind of do all this fun science. And then uh, the lab is kind of uh, starting. So I have an undergrad and a lab tech, a lab manager, uh, and then two rotation students that are helping me kind of go in all these different directions that uh, I could never do in my own. And then we have outside collabor collaborators that are helping us uh, also answer some of these questions through our discovery pipeline with the Meschke Lab, and then the Levin Lab at um, University of Pittsburgh, and she uh, Tara studies uh, Dictostelium and Legionella, but also asking some of the same questions about what uh, kind of evolutionary evolutionarily do, do different uh, eukaryotic systems do to defend against microbes. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>
That was great. Um, I love the Amoeba stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so fun to go off in a different direction. Uh, maybe I'll ask an Amoeba question first. Yeah. So maybe that picture was like an extreme example of a lot of virus on dead Amoeba. Right. But uh, I, when I think about Amoeba, I think about them gobbling up bacteria all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes dragging them into the wrong place. But they must have mechanisms to deal with bacterial inflammatory triggers. Right. Is that a rich area or is there any evidence for that? Yeah, so that's definitely one of the areas that we're thinking about looking. So acanthamoeba has definitely been used uh, as a model for Legionella. Um, so just like uh, the, macro, uh, the macrophage is always eat, gobbling things up and then keeping things uh, in these highly acidified vacuoles, the acanthamoeba do the same thing. Uh, they're, uh, entire, they're heavily phagocytic cells. Uh, and a lot of the same machinery Legionella elaborates to escape the vacuum, uh, to escape like the lysosome inside macrophages is the same thing that they use to escape the vacuoles of uh, acanthamoeba. And so the genetics of acanthamoeba uh, and amoeba in general outside of dictocelium aren't like the best, right? But it would be useful to like use that as kind of a surrogate. So something we know that works, especially something that has, um, so in, in the Legionella model, something that has define mutants that do and do not escape and that can help us kind of point a direction in like what would an inflammatory response look like inside these things. Yeah. Uh, sort of along those lines, you showed that nice picture of the amoeba with the live ones and then the completely dead ones. Mm -hmm. uh, what does uh, uh, an innate immune response to a virus look like in the amoeba? What are you looking for? What is that? How does that manifest? Yeah, that is the golden question. Um, so it's it's kind of it's hard to say, right? Uh, because in cell culture, like with mammalian cells, unless you prime the cells with interferon, everything's probably going to die from the virus infection, anyways, right? And so it's unclear, kind of like how we should try to prime these cells in order to be. Uh, refractory, right? The assumption is that either I can give it a generic PAMP, like a poly-IC, so it's a synthetic double-stranded RNA mimetic, and that there's uh, kind of similar but evolutionary different pattern recognition machinery, so that it's going to bind this, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be in the right place, it's going to be the wrong thing, and that's going to set off some sort of kind of transcriptional cascade. That's kind of my, that's my bias, largely because I study interferon. Um, but there's also the idea that uh, you can do something sequence dependent, right? So if you think about CRISPR-Cas9 systems, or uh, CRISPR-Cas systems rather, and you think about RNAi, uh, giving those systems a generic PAMP will do nothing when you feed it then a, new, uh, a virus that has nothing to do with the PAMP, right? And so we're trying in the lab to do both of those things at once. And so we've recently harvested DNA from these giant viruses. We're chopping it up and trying to make either uh, RNA transcripts or just the DNA to give the amoeba at first. And then at different times post-infection, challenge them to see whether or not any of that has an impact on virus infection. And then also just giving them generic PAMPs uh, that we kind of all know and love for, from uh, mammalian systems, see if that works. But it's a different, it's a shot in the dark, really. Susan? That was a beautiful mom, thank you so much. The um, ASG screen, I was expecting to see a bunch of genes that have been associated with like type 1 interferonopathies, like the and other, but TREX1, SAMHD1, none of those were on your list. Do you have an idea of why? Uh, so that was just uh, the library that we used, right? So this was a very focused library on transcription factors and uh, uh, transcriptional machinery, right? So if we had I, if we had used like a larger kind of like genome-wide library, we absolutely would have found those. Like at least, at least I believe so, right? Um, but I think that's why it's just the bias of the library. And then the genes that you did identify that are associated with diseases are those diseases. Any of them like interferonopathy type of picture? Kind of Not really. Like I mean, it's hard to say. So most of them are neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases, um, but. Uh, and so interferon has never been described as the problem, 
for these specific ones, but that doesn't mean that it isn't, right? So especially when, we, when I think about kind of like that stem cell work that I started all this with, one of the, what we found in that work is that if you have kind of interferon going off at these early developmental stages, as you try to differentiate a stem cell, it really uh, skews the differentiation profile of uh, these cells. And so they can't actually access all the lineages, right? And so it could uh, very well be that in the very beginning, this dysregulation uh, is kind of forcing that as well. So you get all these kind of developmental issues. But it's unclear. And then can I ask another question? Um, regarding the amoeba, mm -hmm. um, how are you conceptually thinking about sort of the post-pathogen interaction as being the complicating issue here, right? Because amoeba, the giant viruses of amoeba sort of by default know how to get around the amoeba host defenses, right? How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so um, this is like, so what we're trying to do right now is try to make some sort of like rescue system, some sort of genetic system. And so then essentially uh, make knockouts of uh, just the whole, like there are 400 genes, so it's just gonna be like a large like transposon library. And then ask what is able to survive in these amoeba and not. And we're gonna get a lot of things out that have nothing to do with host response, but like that'll at least kind of start pointing us in a direction. Uh, we have two of these viruses, but there are a lot of sequences of these, of these especially this Marseille virus family. I think there are now like 37 different uh, like sequence viruses. And so again, like, you know, if we think of uh, some of our other vi DNA viruses, like uh, the herpes family, right? Like some of these uh, uh, host kind of restriction genes are quite conserved, right? Whereas other things are a bit accessory. accessory. So uh, yeah, it's kind of just feeling it out. <laughs> um, and ideally, if we can find a way to like activate a response inside of these, even if it's not transcriptional, kind of like individually cloning these uh, uh, viral genes, expressing them in amoeba, then challenging with them uh, would be how we do that second. A lot of work for somebody who's not me. Um, I had a question about your first story. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that um, alu element detection, right, is, doesn't seem to be the mechanism mm -hmm. for this response. And I was wondering if you think that's because, you know, the cyan elements aren't, aren't up regulated or there's some redundancy there. Mm -hmm. And if you've looked at all across different families of retro elements, that if you see dysregulation there. Yeah, so this is something that I'm really excited to do. Uh, I, like myself, couldn't figure out how to do that, right? Um, it also seems that, for the most part, what's being made are like very short RNAs. Um, so if you try to like stain the cell with like a double-stranded RNA antibody, like the J2 antibody, um, that antibody only recognizes things that are greater than 40 base pairs, right? And so if you stain with this, you actually can't see anything. Um, and so that kind of, it's one way to suggest that it's like smaller things, uh, but we also don't really know. And so like, you know, we have some sequencing and like being able to go back and try to map that onto the genome and ask uh, what's going up, what's going down is like one of the things that we really wanna do. Yeah, Mark went online asks, what's known about the polymorphisms of human DR1 and DRAP1 and the risk of either infection versus autoimmune and autoinflammatory disease? Do they show up in GWAS or other genetic screens? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I picked those two hits because they were the strongest hits, uh, but they are lethal hits, right? And so if you knock them both out, like the cells do not survive, right? And so there are no genetics because there are no people. All right, thank you.